Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. This is actually uh, my fifth year as a member of the Global Genes community. And you know, I have to say, this is um, one of the events that I find uh, most remarkable and most inspiring every, day, every year. So I, it's a real honor to be here. Um, to kind of motivate this session, I you know, kind of wanted to start by saying, um, as someone who's involved in medical research, uh, one of the things that I, I think we all see is that there are some type of medical breakthroughs that happen at the lab bench. Um, people uh, working late into the night, uh, mixing reagents together to make great discoveries. Um, another class of medical breakthroughs uh, happens only by uh, engaging with patients and understanding um, their disease uh, story and their life stories, and that has led to just as many medical breakthroughs. Um, and as someone who's trained in medicine, I'll be honest, it's this latter category of patient-centric research that I really find uh, most inspiring and most motivating. And so it's a real honor to uh, be able to be participating in this session today that's really centered on patient-centric research. Um, and one of the things that I believe, and probably many people in this room share, is that although patient-centric research has been incredibly powerful in the history of medicine, we haven't yet achieved its full potential. And I think one of the main reasons for that is that our mechanism for collecting the data from the patients is mediated through healthcare professionals. So they observe the patients, they ask the questions, and then they're the ones who report back the data. But actually, there's a bigger opportunity before us, which is to engage the patients directly themselves and learn directly from the patients. And that's really what motivates a lot of the topics that we'll be seeing today. Um, and I think one of the things that's exciting and one of the things that I'm especially optimistic and hopeful about is there are so many efforts across the ecosystem where this dynamic is changing and leading to a new kind of patient-centric research. So uh, with that, uh, let me turn it over to Luke, uh, who will talk about his efforts, and then we'll go through the other members. And then uh, hopefully, we're certainly going to have time for Q&A at the end, uh, and actually really want to have a patient-centric discussion. So thank you. Thank you. It's been quite an honor to be here. I, I really appreciate it. And you know, I'm, I, I will say I'm, I'm probably going to stray wildly from um, any slides here because, <laughs> because uh, you know, I'm constantly learning from every single person in this room. And when Rachel was up just speaking, I realized that everything that we do and everything I've been thinking about, talking about, can really be driven by um, the ability to answer those questions. You know, what are you proud of? What do you hope for? And what are you afraid of? And so uh, forgive me if I jump ahead because I realize that um, might be better served answering those questions. Um, so uh, I, we talk about the driving force, right? And um, you know uh, what our role is in not just uh, research and development, but research and development this for this generation, right? So there's this um, or this urgency that uh, exists in, in 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 everything we do. So that's something that will uh, certainly. Uh, be at the core of, of what I imagine this discussion will be the, the, the sense of urgency. Um, and, and the first one is, uh, is the impact that we can have and, and, and thinking, about, uh, thinking about the science of everything we do and, 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 and turning it from um, uh, what is a, a, a structural understanding of, in many cases, a gene, or it's certainly in our case, um, uh, my daughter uh, was diagnosed two years ago with a, a, a mutation in her KF1A gene, and one of the first things we realized is that we need to find other kids like her because there weren't too many. And uh, we started finding people, and we started finding uh, different mutations, and we, we looked at what we had, and we started marking it down and, and keeping good lists. But you know, and Susanna's there, circled uh, in, in red, P305L, and. What we quickly realized is that it's really, so many of us in here have these, uh, are, are part of these communities that have such a small prevalence. And it's when we make that, the idea that it becomes about the relevance and not the prevalence is something that's incredibly important and, and, and fuels that urgency and, and, and inspiration. And so it's when this image becomes this image that we really start um, understanding that, and again, just like, Rachel was talking about um, the idea of our children as not just you know, phenotypes. So P305L uh, might have 
seizure disorder and movement disorder, but if we start thinking about Susanna and, and pictures of uh, images of our, our, our children and the, and the people who are at the core of everything we're doing, that's when I think that the, yeah, the patient's role and the family's role and, and uh, our role in this whole process really becomes, um, it leads to efficiencies because it makes everybody work with a pace that's required in, in, in our rare disease space. So, um, yeah, and that's what's, um, so in, in many ways, I think that's what we're proud of to answer um, Rachel's questions. So this is something we're proud of that we're able to connect these people and to identify the, not just the science, but the humanity of everything we're doing. So it moves from being patient focused to human focused really because we're thinking about, we're thinking as parents and we're thinking as, as uh, from that point of view. Um, and then it's really important, again, I, I, I learning so much from you and, and listening to Rachel to, to really colloquialize that science, right? And so when we're building a, a community of, of, of people, we're able to, to translate in a way that is accessible to everybody. Um, and it, it really, it, it starts with um, setting that, that urgent pace and that, that rapid pace. And we can be responsible for making sure that uh, that that, uh, that pace exists throughout the entire process. Uh, and for us, it started with uh, finding the A team, I call it, and, and it's not just because uh, you know, the skill set that these scientists and these physicians have is, is, is tremendous and, and that they don't just you know, think outside the box, but you know, rather getting rid of the box completely to try to uh, figure out a way to, to, to help our children, but because we were very lucky, we found our A team were, were advocates, right? So if you, you find a physician and you find researchers that are already advocates, and you don't have to convince anybody about uh, you know, the, the incredible urgent need we have to develop these treatments, then you're already way ahead of the game. So we were just amazingly lucky because we found our A team here when, when Susanna was diagnosed, and, and we didn't have to fight for uh, it, as much as members certainly of our community that we've that we've found and identified are really have to fight for because we we really lucked out and and that a team has become um, central to everything we do and and so it is identifying that a team and then committing to supporting that work and I, I, I think that one of the traps that is easy to fall into is uh, not just being um, confused about the words, but uh, supporting uh, duplicative work. And that, again, wastes, wastes time and takes away from the, uh, the importance of, of that urgency. Um, and then, uh, you know, partnering, moving beyond the, the, that A team and into the whole scientific community is important. And that's, again, just by uh, being loud and, and, and screaming from the mountaintop about what you do hope for. And we all hope for um, a, a meaningful change from from all of this work that, that the A team and the growing A team is doing. So identifying that hope is amazingly important. And then I'll skip quickly ahead. What we're afraid of is not being um, able to pull the trigger, right, to execute uh, the result of this growing work in real time. So when we understand the work that's happening and we're able to, to package it together and uh, share it with others. You're able to go down the entire, uh, I'm getting one minute, I, I see, I'll, I'll rush. You're able to, to, to identify everything that's needed and, and the phases and the, uh, the information that will help that urgency and will help that discovery. So if, if, as a foundation, if we can work together with the researchers and as families come together and understand that by creating these tools, will have a kind of cross-functional effect on, on how we might be able to uh, get to that point of where we hope for, uh, which is uh, a, a therapy for our children. And so we can move from um, the preclinical phase, uh, you know, we can have uh, tools together for when we do eventually get to the clinical trial part of things, and then even uh, you know, at the regulatory phase and then, and then past that. Um, and so that's, that's something that we all uh, really hope for, and, and, and it's by answering Rachel's questions and, and thinking about things like Evie's awesomeness test instead of the Vineland scale, and things like that, and, and, and applying those to uh, how we uh, 
we, we inf infuse everything. So thank you for letting me uh, be here. I appreciate it. Uh, so next will be Daniel. Good morning. It's uh, my first time at Global Genes, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm going to tell you a, a bit of my family story, our personal story, and I'll try to make some points that I hope will be relevant to everybody. And the reason I'm here is that I have a nine-year-old daughter called Natasha. Natasha is a very pretty, that's what I think, energetic, extremely sweet girl, and likes to do things that any kid likes to do, likes to play basketball, likes to go swimming, etc. But see, Natasha has Dravet syndrome. Dravet is a very severe type of epilepsy ca caused by mutations. And an SCN1A gene causes many seizures. Not very long ago, Natasha used to have up to 40 seizures on any given night. Spent many days in the hospital, in ICU, um, developmental delays, and so on. And as we many times hear the numbers, we know that about 30 million Americans are affected by rare diseases, one in 10. But those numbers don't tell the whole story. We know it's much broader than that. We have four kids. Natasha is uh, one of our twin girls. We have two older boys. And the impact in the family and the siblings has been tremendous. That said, I mean, Natasha's siblings are her biggest fans. We really realized, I mean, through when they were growing up, how it affected them. So David, my youngest son, won his spelling bee on third grade. Comes home very happy. My wife and I, David, that's amazing. What was a winning word? He says, Dad, it was pharmacy. <laughs> There's no way I was going to miss that word. <laughs> I see it every day. And the good thing, they, t they take me up to task. As you'll hear a little bit later, most of my work these days, my life, is toward curing Natasha and curing epilepsy, curing rare diseases. I get home every day, and my kids tell me, Daddy, how was work today? So it was great. And tell me, have you found that cure for Natasha? I'm like, not yet. So they tell me, well, it hasn't been that great yet. Once you find it, that's OK. So my point here is, yeah, it impacts a lot of people, impacts a family. I think it's, imp it's important that we take it in a positive way. My hope is that I can cure my daughter, I can cure other kids, and we can have a positive impact on families. I'm sure that those kids, those siblings, will be much better people for that. I know that if we don't cure it, they will cure it one day. Nicole, her twin sister, already told me, Daddy, I am going to be a doctor. So I hope that we're having a, a positive impact. So my message here is get involved. Whatever you do, find a way that works for you, find what's best for you, and just do something about it. In our case, we, my wife advocates. She gets involved with foundations, advocates for medical marijuana. The twin sister, Nicole, in her, I think it was third grade um, science fair, actually created a design and did a nice sock for Natasha for her pulse oximeter that she uses to sleep uh, every night so we can monitor she has seizures. So get involved. And again, it's a, it's a family affair. It's not an individual affair. Get involved with companies. Get involved in clinical trials. Support researchers. We get Natasha involved. We have started together with companies several cl clinical trials. Some of them have worked. Others have not. But you have to keep trying. Again, get involved. On my side, what I like to do, and maybe what I, I think I do best, is start companies. Um, in the past, I started a company in Atlanta where we repurposed um, existing FDA-approved drugs to treat Dravet, developed computational models and very new uh, zebrafish models that would mimic the disease uh, in individual patients with the disease. We repurposed for drugs that, that help patients. Then we decided to move to Boston. We think a lot of the research in biotech is being done in Boston, so I joined MIT, and we started a new company. Um, why? Because that's what I like to do. That's probably what I do best. And it's about me, and I found a great group of people. 
my message here is to reach out to people. You're not alone. Uh, there are many people who know the science. I didn't know how to draw a chromosome either. As I tell many people, I didn't know the difference between a chromosome and a gene. I was completely foreign to that. But find the people that know how to do it, and trust me, just call them, and they'll help you. There's a lot of good people, a lot of knowledge, and people will help you. So right now, our latest venture, actually, Tavard, a strange name. It's basically, basically Dravé backwards, because our goal is to turn around Dravé to finally cure it, not only treat it. So we're working on a no very novel gene therapy approach for Dravé, and actually also other diseases caused by haploinsufficiency. So I'm just going to finish with some thoughts. So first of all, get involved. And I say about best fit. Find the best fit. One, for the disease. Is there a foundation? No, maybe sort of foundation there. Are there animal models? Are there academic researchers working on that? What are you best at? Are you best at advocating? Are you best at starting a foundation? Do you want to start a company? Do you like getting involved with the science? Find something and get involved. Partner, find others. Again, you're not alone. Find others with the same issues. Bring them together and work with them. Um, I always tell people, I don't think one person is going to cure Dravet. It's going to take a, it's a team effort. It's too complex. We're dealing with a brain, so it's going to be a group of people. Race awareness. As we know, there are 7,000 rare diseases. Uh, limited number of companies, uh, biotech companies and pharma companies working on this. So raise awareness. If they don't know what the disease is, they're never going to work on it. So you have to go do the groundwork, teach them about the disease, create awareness. Bring new perspectives. So about five years ago, I went to a, an epilepsy conference in the NIH. And at the end of the conference, they had a, a medical historian. And he said, I've been coming to this conference for 10 years, and it's always the same people talking about the same thing. You're never going to cure epilepsy like that. So bring new people. Bring new approaches. Don't be afraid of that. I mean, the status quo, unfortunately, is not going to cure our kids and our diseases. Bring the passion that only caregivers and parents and patients can bring. And companies appreciate that, our passion, our drive, our sense of urgency. But most importantly, for us, it's yes, it's about healing the patient, it's about healing our kid, but it's healing for us. People ask me, how do you cope with this? This is a joke. I say, well, a lot of coffee and a lot of alcohol, but that's a joke. <laughs> but the way we cope with it is being involved, feeling that we do something about it. That's what empowers us. That's what gives us healing. That's what creates hope for a lot of people. And people have asked me, well, you work on that day in and day out. How do you separate work from family? I say, I don't. That's what we talk about at dinner. And that's what my kids want to hear. That's what my family wants to hear. So make it, again, a family effort. Again, it's part of the healing process. I promise. Just get involved. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jeffrey. So, Jeff Sherman, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Horizon Pharma. Yeah, as the title of this session uh, you know, really states, patients driving advances from research to therapy, first and foremost, you know, we're all patients at the end of the day. I may have gone into you know, the healthcare professional area because I thought I could make a difference in developing new medicines early on, uh, realized uh, I, I'm a patient as well. Uh, I went through internal medicine training, infectious disease training, wound up going to a large infectious disease conference and coming home with pneumonia and having to be hospitalized. Uh, and my, my wife went through uh, uh, flu and wound up getting complicated by uh, bacterial infection and had to be hospitalized. Uh, 
So early on, I sort of realized that I go into the wrong field, or uh, maybe it was the right field, so I uh, had a better understanding of what's going on. But really realized uh, early on that you know we're all patients. What can we do to really learn from one another? And and that's really a lot of what Global Genes is all about. Um, you know, we all may be involved in doing research in or involved with rare diseases, but what can we really do collectively here and, and really have you know, uh, been enriched personally and professionally from my interactions with the organization? Uh, one of the areas that I've been involved with, not only at Global Genes and Medical Science Advisory Board with uh, another not-for-profit, the Drug Information Association that brings together government regulators from around the world, uh, individuals from academia, patient groups, industry to look at ways of facilitating drug development. And in that, uh, I've been involved as the uh, former chair of their board of directors, but I'm also the uh, liaison from the, F, uh, from the DIA to what's called the FDA, Food and Drug Administration Clinical Trial Transformation Initiative, or CITI. So this is the FDA looking at what can get done to facilitate drug development. And part of it, they really looked at, so who are all the stakeholders involved? You know, certainly there's the government regulators, the FDA. They can't do it alone. Um, Individuals bring clinical studies, so they brought together academic investigators, industry, but probably most importantly, it's really the patient groups. Uh, and this is, again, all about you know, all of us as you know, patients, potential patients, individuals with loved ones as patients, and what can we really learn from one another, and what can we do to really help facilitate the development of uh, medicines for unmet medical need, and we know uh, particularly that there's over 7,000 rare diseases, only 5% of treatment, and a lot of those are, are lacking. So one of the things that the city initiative uh, did is they looked at what are called some of the, what are some of the, you know, best practices and really looking at interactions, whether it's uh, government regulators with individuals who are actually doing the clinical trials, patient groups as well, and it was really coming back to, and, and this is on the city website, this is uh, this figure or what's called a chevron, to really look at what are those things that you know, individuals can do, whether they're individuals from industry, patient groups, whatever, to really help to move this whole area forward. And you know, having been involved now uh, for a number of years in the rare disease area, uh, it, what we do is to look first and foremost to patient and patient groups who really know more about the disease, the entity, uh, and some of what uh, Rachel uh, you know, highlighted before. What are not only you know, the struggles and other things that need to be thought about in doing clinical trials? And some of it is you know, you know, what some individuals may or may not really uh, think about, and it's really raising our consciousness in terms of, so what is the most important thing? What is that endpoint that would really make a difference in everyone's life? How do we structure the trial in a way that's really conducive to have individuals involved? I mean, we can sit back from a industry perspective and say, oh, geez, it would be great if patients come in for these, you know, type of, uh, you know, interventions, et cetera, but is that practical, is it not? You know, what is it? And really have to think about it from, you know, an individual patient perspective. What would it be like going through these studies? What can get done that would really make a difference? So, you know, what this highlights, and uh, this will be available for uh, everyone, uh, you know, the slides, is to really look at and take an inventory and this is for each and every individual patient group, you know, what are those things that you know, can bring to the table? What are the strengths of our organization? Is it really in, do we have a, a, a registry or information on natural history of the disease which may or may not be known? Uh, is this a registry of patients, families that may be 
willing to participate in clinical trials? Is it really the knowledge or you know, connections with researchers in an area that may or may not be apparent in terms of whether it's information on biomarkers, other things as well? So part of this is really what can we all do together uh, to really advance treatment so in a few years from now we don't really have to talk about the over 7,000 and growing number of rare diseases, only 5% of ha have treatments, that there's not only treatments, but hopefully even advanced to cures for all of these diseases. So thank you again. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, so as uh, Meredith mentioned in the beginning, uh, most of my time is spent at the Broad Institute. Um, and there, you know, it's a scientific institution affiliated with Harvard and MIT. And I've had the privilege of knowing a lot of really brilliant scientists, um, individuals who've made profound advances in genome editing technologies or major genetic discoveries. Um, but one of the individuals that I find most truly inspiring in the world uh, is Brad Margus. Um, so he's a good friend now for several years. Uh, I don't know if, if you know him, but um, he has a story in life that's actually in many ways quite similar to Daniel. Uh, he started off as an executive in the food industry, uh, had four children, uh, two were diagnosed with the brutal disease, ataxia telangiectasia, uh, which is marked by neurodegeneration, so uh, your, his children were in the wheelchairs by the age of 10, uh, immune dysfunction, early onset cancers. And it's a very rare disorder with about 500 patients uh, that are affected in the US and less than 10,000 believed to be affected worldwide. I, and so I became friends with Brad uh, through a number of different sort of scientific projects. And over um, the course of our friendship, he, he approached me with a, an idea. And I think it was really inspiring, and I, and I give Brad a lot of, of credit. Um, and he, he said, you know, I'd like to build a new kind of rare disease registry. And, and it should have the following three features. So first of all, it should be patient-centric. And I'll get into what I mean by that in a second. And second, it should be technologically enabled, um, involve molecular profiling, collect rich phenotypic data from patients. Um, but the most important feature of it was that, and this goes back to the patient-centric side of it, was that it should be owned by the patients themselves uh, rather than by the researcher who collected the data uh, or by company or, or something like that. And, and the motivation there was really not because his foundation wanted to hoard the data, but actually because it's exactly the opposite. They wanted as many people to use it as possible. Um, and so one of the things that I'm lucky is in my life at the Broad, uh, I lead a group of software engineers and machine learning experts. And a lot of our deliverables are very much outside of the traditional academic research track in the sense that um, nobody's asking me how many papers I write. What they do care about is that we make software that's impactful for the world. And so uh, you know, for me, it was an ideal opportunity to work with a good friend on this project. Um, so let me kind of walk through just a, a few of the features of this. So if you think about how we do uh, medical research in a traditional setting, it's often very hospital or medical center centric, which is to say there's a medical center and that recruits patients from within the medical center. Uh, and then researchers uh, will access the data and they're often again within that medical center. But if you think about many other aspects of our life, uh, there's the opportunity for software to really scale what we've traditionally done. And, and maybe uh, an analogy in our daily lives you might think about is something like ride hailing apps like Lyft. Uh, you know, in a world where there's only one dispatcher, you're limited by the number of people that can ride or the number of cabs that can be in a network. But with something, with software, you have infinite scalability and you can do things on a much bigger scale. Um, and so it presents a few different advantages. So first, you know, the cost of bringing in patients is much lower. Uh, second, as I mentioned, it's much more scalable. And this is actually especially important for rare diseases. You know, if you think about any given rare disease, how many patients might any one medical center actually see? Uh, whereas if you can actually scale your efforts across the country as a whole, or, or ideally even the world, then again, there's a chance to really do a much uh, bigger study than you would otherwise. Um, moreover, a lot of things that are traditionally hard in medical research, like recontacting individuals to collect more data from them, um, are greatly facilitated in this approach. But the most important thing is that it really empowers patient, and it changes the dynamic of the research study from being about um, researchers uh, and patients to being a partnered effort. And I think this is a really powerful idea. You know, when I think about my training in medicine, one of the things that I find kind of remarkable uh, is that you, know, you can donate your organs, um, you can donate your blood, but we don't actually have a mechanism to donate our data. 
And when you think about what medical research really needs the most right now, in many ways it is access to rich data that can be shared and used by researchers around the world. Uh, so in essence, worked with Brad over a period of about two and a half years, where did some very simple things. Stood up a web page, um, worked very closely with the disease community to make sure that um, it followed the, the sensibilities and look and feel of what they wanted to see. Built out basic limbs infrastructure to collect uh, various uh, genotypic and phenotypic information. And then most importantly, put the data in a cloud-based place where researchers from around the world could access it. And the way we structured it was that Brad's Disease Foundation owns all aspects of this. So the, the software that we developed is open source. So if at any given moment he doesn't like the way that I'm doing things, he can take it and hire somebody else to operate it. When researchers apply to access the data, they don't apply and talk to me, they talk to Brad and his disease foundation directly, and he's built a trusted council of people that acts on behalf of the patients and reviewing the applications for the data. And again, the idea is that the data be maximally shared rather than really sort of proprietary to any one researcher or company. Uh, and so, you know, as I said, it's been launched about two and a half years ago, uh, and there are about 500 patients in the US, about 200 have been enrolled so far, and really have a goal of getting roughly all 500. Moreover, I have launched uh, in 11 countries now, uh, seven different languages, and again, over the next few years, would really like to see a large number of individuals be recruited from around the world. And the real goal here is to be able to, uh, you know, uh, enroll a large number of patients with a guy, with the goal of developing new therapies for this brutal disease. Um, moreover, as we went down this road, we realized that maybe a lot of aspects of what we were trying to do resonated um, with various different disease groups and so have started to take on a number of efforts like this, um, ranging from an effort on undiagnosed diseases with Daniel MacArthur, who's a good friend and colleague at the Broad Institute, to the Prion Disease Foundation, and many other efforts. Uh, so with that, uh, let me end, and we'll start uh, with some questions uh, across all of these. Okay, so thank you. Um, all right, excellent. So I think uh, in terms of structuring this session, we'll do uh, a few questions to get us started and loosen up the panelists, uh, and then uh, turn it over to all of you and definitely put them on the hot seat. Uh, don't ask me questions, put, put them on the hot seat. <laughs> so, no, actually, I'm kidding. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, so, you know, to start off with, um, when, you, when we think about the world of uh, patient-centric research, what are some of the important uh, perspectives that patients and caregivers bring to rare disease research and development? And Luke, maybe, let me start with you and your experiences in KIF-1. Yeah. Um, I, the, I, I, you know, and I keep hearkening back to it, it it's the, the, uh, the sense of urgency, right? And, and the idea of uh, uh, the constant fear that uh, the uh, machine, if you will, isn't, uh, isn't, isn't always, always moving because there are so many different moving parts that um, uh, if, the, the, the patients and the families can be the kind of uh, the oil and the facilitator, but also to be uh, making sure that all of these different moving parts are organized enough to um, pull everything together when it counts and to understand, you know, what does matter most and what would be a meaningful change. I think that that's important is to, is to uh, express that very clearly and that, you know, while it would be great to, um, uh, and I, I use this example from time to time, is my daughter Susanna has a very uh, specific place in the living room that she loves, and it's uh, about 15 feet from the bathroom. Yeah, and now Susanna can't walk maybe 10 feet without without falling and 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 um, sometimes hurting herself. And and we just know that what would be truly meaningful for us would uh, be five more steps, because if she could just walk five more steps. She could get to the bathroom. She might be able to be toilet trained. We wouldn't be late for my son's school. There wouldn't be this uh, ball of anxiety that ends up being a trigger for our seizures. And you know, it's just that if we could just, that five steps would be truly meaningful. And I think that by patients and families and foundations being able to have that insight and say, look, this is what would be meaningful, then uh, we can pass the baton to the people with different skill sets to, uh, to execute that. So just to press on that question, um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of times academic researchers don't feel that same sense of urgency that you describe. So how do we get them to have the extra five steps that you described and a sense of urgency, getting data out earlier, sharing it, 
public publishing earlier more yeah. urgent, urgency. Video. I, I, I truly think that if we're if we're making impactful, well produced uh, 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 videos that are um, insights that that aren't promotional in any way, but are truly just a, a slice of life, and we can send a link to a researcher. We do that all the time. You know, I've done it at, at, with your colleagues at the Broad. I've you know said, hey, here, look, this is what's going on. You know, and and the great part about having uh, 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 the capabilities to um, to create these videos that are a slice of life is you're not, you know, gone are the days where we have to spend millions and millions of dollars flying to, you know, Japan and Australia just to make contact and see if there's a kid similar to Susanna, right? We can send a link. And so I think that uh, if, we can, if we can articulate it in that digital way, we'll be able to um, give people quick insight to what really matters. Um, and Daniel, maybe you can say a little bit about your perspective on this. Yeah, so I think that tied to what you said, um, sense of urgency is, and this one might sound obvious, which is, putting patient front and center. And many times we talk to researchers and everybody's focused on their field in the animal model, on the IPSC, on the chemistry, and the data and the numbers. But many times they forget that there's actually a patient, yeah. a kid that is affected by that. And that's what actually creates that sense of urgency. And I think that the other thing that, that we as patients can do is we had a day-to-day -day experience with what works and what doesn't work. And many times we have extremely valuable insight for researchers and, and pharma companies. If you look in Dravé, the whole medical marijuana revolution started with some families in Colorado that were actually, for some reason, giving high CBD, low THC um, combos to their kids, and the thought was that it worked. I mean, there were limited clinical trials of one, two, but, um, the, the thought was that it worked, and from there it went to a, a full-blown clinical trial, and then the first uh, medical marijuana product approved in the U.S. for Dravet Epidiolics. So I think drawing um, patient experience and expertise, at the end, as we've seen, nobody knows more about the disease in their kids than the families and the caregivers. And it, it's key for not only companies, but also doctors to, to listen always to, to patients. And, there's a lot, a lot of information and insight that can be, be drawn from there. So switching gears, um, Jeffrey, maybe you can say a little bit about some of the challenges faced by industry uh, as they try to give patients more of a central role in research and development. Well, you know, having been involved with rare diseases, uh, just by the nature of working in rare diseases, it's one, finding individuals, patients, and because uh, there's really a spectrum that we found in terms of there's some very well-developed patient groups that are readily available, some that may not. Uh, this is where the strength of a Global Genes comes in as an umbrella organization to help really you know, raise awareness, not only about you know, rare diseases, the whole spectrum, but also bringing a lot of groups together and helping to make the connections between industry and patient groups and then really providing then, uh, the key insights on you know, what are those considerations if it's drug development. You know, for instance, one of the areas that we're involved with, uh, urea cycle disorder. So you know, again, what does that really mean? Uh, individuals who uh, lack an enzyme to uh, you know, detoxify a breakdown pro a product of protein. So you know, we had breakfast, we may take it for granted that we can eat, digest everything, not a problem. You know, individuals uh, with urea cycle disorder, uh, one of the breakdown products of protein is ammonia. Ammonia can be toxic, and for these individuals, uh, it could lead to irreversible brain damage or worst case uh, you know, death unless they really have or taking an ammonia scavenger, watching diet, et cetera. So it's really connecting, let's say, you know, let's say a company who's involved in doing research with you know, patient, uh, you know, knowledgeable patient groups that can really help us to really you know, understand what are the challenges, what are the considerations in doing uh, clinical research. So through Global Genes, we've been able to link in with uh, you know, Michael and 
de Leon and his uh, wife uh, to really help move this whole uh, area forward. And maybe just give a little bit more on, on the interaction that you've had with them and how it's changed the course of your company's research. Well, one, it's really raised awareness of all the components, everything that needs to be thought about in, in doing a, uh, you know, a clinical study. It's not just the pharmaceutical you know, intervention, it's you know, really thinking about you know, the dietary considerations, what goes into you know, dealing with just you know, when there is an intercurrent illness, uh, seeking care, uh, just you know, really going through it and la raising a level of consciousness on what the whole patient journey is and what really has to be taken into account in really developing a clinical study or a drug development program to be successful. Excellent. Um, so maybe we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers from the audience. Uh, and like I said, please do um, you know, push us a little bit in, in terms of how we can how we can further this important area. Hi, I just want to say thank you. My name is Lisa Schill. Jeffrey, I know you mentioned a little bit about um, you know, the importance of sort of legislation and the FDA and the drug development process with biomarkers, but I didn't really hear any of you talk about the importance of getting involved in the legislation. Um, so have you gotten involved in any of the legislation? Yeah, so I can speak to that. Uh, a big part of what we do, we, uh, Horizon has a, uh, a booth here, is really working with, uh, you know, we have a Washington office working on uh, the Hill, so to speak, to really continue to raise the importance of, you know, rare disease, rare disease legislation, uh, which has really transformed uh, and helped to uh, provide, you know, impetus for a lot of the research that's been going on in areas of rare disease where companies, and it's typically, you know, small biotechs that may be running on a shoestring can get, uh, you know, one, you know, as they bring a new product forward, uh, not having to, you know, pay what is now, I think, two to three million dollars in a PDUFA or a prescription drug user fee uh, just to have the FDA review the application. That's waived. There's other, you know, incentives as well, which is really important for a small company. And so it's, you know, to continue to press you know, legislators, et cetera, to uh, not forget about, you know, uh, you know rare diseases, uh, because it could be any one of them, their loved ones as well. So that's an important point uh, that you've raised, and it's something that just has to be continually reminded, especially when, uh, you know, our elected politicians may get involved or may be distracted by other issues, uh, but this is one that's, you know, certainly, you know, close to home for each and every one of us. Hi. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm with the Jane Foundation. I just want to say thank you so much for leading this important discussion. Um, my question is, um, about how to organize and translate patient reported data uh, so that it's acceptable for clinical trial design by the FDA or by the, the leaders of clinical trials. We have our natural history we've been doing for years and I've been observing how that data behind the scenes is being translated and we're sharing that with um, companies and with, uh, in, in terms of trial design help, but we have so much direct patient contact and valuable data from the patients that we can be collecting in our registry. And one thing I'm wanting some guidance on uh, from you all is how can we format that data in such a way that it is acceptable? Uh, maybe right up your alley. Well, I was actually maybe, Dan well, I I'm happy to opine up, but Daniel, maybe why don't you start off? How about you? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not a clinical trials yet, I'm from you, so. Right. Sure. Pretty so, uh, you know, let me start by saying I'm also not a clinical trialist, but I do have a lot of experience in yeah. managing data. And so uh, I think there are a few things that go into this. Um, 
One is uh, you know, the importance of having a rigorous quality control and uh, system in place. So you know, it's not at all uncommon that you'll do a lot of things like cross-validation uh, between where you'll ask different populations the same question slightly different ways and make sure that you get the same answer back. Uh, the importance of kind of maintaining um, what they call provenance, which is a record of everyone who's touched the data and all the ways that they've transformed it so that uh, when it then comes time for submission, um, that record is kept and that's actually very important as well. Uh, you get into the world of um, not just uh, questionnaire level data, but lots of other data points that are collected from patients, whether it be their laboratory values or um, uh, you know, data from medical devices, things like that. And again, uh, there's often a validation step that has to go into it before you can utilize the data that's there. So as a concrete, concrete example, uh, we now live in the world where a lot of uh, com consumer technology companies uh, are making uh, the step of actually uh, collecting physiologic data whether it be ECGs or heart rates or things like that. Uh, you know, that's very important. In some cases, they've taken the extra step of getting uh, medical regulatory approval. In other cases, they haven't. So making sure that if you're designing a natural history study, you're mindful of working with the groups who have taken that extra step. So I don't know that there's a one size fits all, but I, I think one of the biggest things, honestly, is um, having people that you're partnered with who have done it before and kind of work closely with you to make sure that the data you're collecting, which especially in rare diseases is, is truly very, very, very valuable and very hard to come by. And so having the team in place, the A team, as Luke said, uh, that, that can actually really be a, a thought partner in the process. Can I add to, oh, oh please. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'll just add one, on. one quick, quickly. I think that also, I imagine part of that would be um, making it accessible very early in the process because, um, you know, again, thinking about efficiencies, if that uh, information is available to incorporate into any kind of trial design or protocol development um, early, it's, you know, it takes a long time to file an amendment, I imagine, with the FDA, right? So if something gets sent back to you and you have to redo it again because that information and those patient and family insights weren't woven in early, then we've wasted time and, and resources, right? But if we figure out a way to articulate it early and can incorporate it into the early development of clinical trials, then I, I think that's gonna be, you know, a, a good game changer, is making it accessible early in the, in, in the therapeutic process. Yeah, I think the other one is uh, thinking early on and agreeing what the endpoints are gonna be. And we see that in, in, in Dravet, which is a type of epilepsy, the typical endpoints in a clinical trial is seizure frequency. Um, once we get, but we know there are much more many issues than that when we look at Dravé. Um, cognitive impairment, like a muscle, muscle tone, well, death by Sureb is another, is another issue. So the challenge that we have right now is we start, we're pretty early on in the process. We're not close to clinical trials yet, but it's, we start thinking when we're developing a, a gene therapy that we hope is gonna have a, a holistic effect on the disease, not only on seizures, how do we start thinking about those different endpoints that we're gonna to have to show in order to justify gene therapy that's very different to a small molecule that's in the market only for treating the disease. So I think it's thinking early on and agreeing with the, with the FDA what the, all the endpoints are gonna be and how you're gonna measure them. So I, I would just add, really think about the end in mind. So the end in mind is to really be able to extract information to hopefully facilitate the development process and that typically there are data standards and other things that just make it very easy to extract the data. Um, and a lot of that came about because is, there was a lot of consolidation in the industry. Companies found that they uh, inherited systems that couldn't communicate with one another. So there's what's called a CETUS standards and other things that could readily, you know, communicate and extract the data and information, which is really important. And especially in rare diseases, what the FDA is really looking for, and the FDA publishes guidance on this, uh, natural history of the disease is very, very helpful. Because again, uh, by the virtue of the fact that these are rare diseases, there's not a lot of patients uh, trying to minimize, let's say, the number of patients that have to go through a trial and what can really be learned and understood by 
you know, natural history databases is very important. So things like, you know, the demography or background information of the patient, their whole journey as well, concomitant meds, other things like that, that would otherwise be needed for a clinical trial. So I think we have time for one more question before we end this session. Um, I, right here, I have the microphone. Sorry. Um, it's hard for me to stand up. I just wanted to ask, what is the benefit of the pharmaceutical companies to work with different foundations uh, that only have 500 patients? Or is there any kind? How do we hook up with people? How can we be patient advocates and, and search out a company who would be interested in, in, in doing trials for us? Well, yes. I speak to, uh, there, there's a marked unmet need, and, and certainly companies are looking at you know, what can get done to really accelerate the whole process from a number of aspects. One is, you know, each day you can, you know, let's say, get a product to the market sooner, maybe you know, an extra day a patient may not have to go through, let's say, an unnecessary surgery or whatever. There's also other benefits from the company in terms of you know, helping to then have you know, you know, you know, a, a, a cash flow that can help to really develop other studies, other drugs in that disease. And for a lot of small companies, it's a, a way to really you know, compete that they wouldn't be able to if they were you know, in a larger therapeutic area and just with a lot of the advances that I think you all can speak to, uh, for a lot of the you know, more rare diseases, there are actual targets uh, that are almost readily attainable yeah, and, to go you know, after. And, and everybody needs an advocate, right? That's so, uh, so advocates are such a huge part, but companies need advocates too, right? And so as a foundation, being able to, it doesn't matter you know, what the, the prevalence is, if you're, if you're um, have these capabilities lined up, and you can say, "Listen, we're going to advocate for you." Downstream, it's it's you know, industries need industry needs advocates just as much as as, as we do as a patient. Yeah, hey. and, I, and I think at the end, companies are interested in rare and ultra rare diseases. For many reasons. First of all, the genetic diseases a big advantage is that you have a clear target that, that you can address as opposed to others. Uh, second, if it's part of a platform technology, I mean, this disease can be a, a proof of concept or can be part of that platform. At the end, I'll see if you're talking ultra rare. It's at the end, it's going to come up with uh, up to pro down to pricing. If it's a uh, small incidence, it's going to be for a small number of patients. Uh, usually, at the end, the, the price is going to be be higher than medication, but that that's how it is. Something that that I have found out when I and I've approached many companies in the past to again to create awareness and get them to work on on Jove. And the first question that I always get oh, is there a patient registry? And for me, that, that's critical for any foundation to have a registry. Uh, why? If they're going to do a clinical trial, they want to know that they can access the patients. And, and the more data, the more information on, on patients, even better. So I think the foundation has to build the, um, the base, the foundation, so other companies get interested. Foundation meaning one, um, registry, and second, animal models that everybody can, can be available to everybody in the community, IPSCs and uh, also animal models. The, the, the other is to really raise the awareness on the regulators, too, in terms of what's really important in terms of clinical endpoints. And you know, they're very much, you know, for the FDA, really looking to really get that input uh, of what's really meaningful, what's not, because at the end of the day, it's not just whether there's a statistical significance, but is there something clinically meaningful for the patients, their families, uh, in society for advancing these medicines. Thank you so much, this panel. We are going to go into a um, short networking break, so I encourage you to grab them and ask more questions if you have them. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Anthony, for helping facilitate and to all of our panelists for sharing and recognizing the important role patients play in driving advances. Um, each of them had a very valuable and unique perspective, and we really appreciate you all taking the time. I don't enjoy being the timekeeper down there. It's a lot more pressure than I thought, so I really appreciate you all following along. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Can I get back?
Just a couple of housekeeping things because we won't all be back in here together in this room until later in the day. Um, you're going to hear this um, again and again. Please remember to complete the survey on your mobile app after the sessions. We really do appreciate your feedback and helping us build um, a bigger and better conference each year. Um, this year we have uh, several poster presentations from our 2018 Rare Patient Impact Grant recipients out uh, in the foyer outside of the ballroom. This is the first time we're trying out poster presentations. We're starting with our Impact Grant winners, um, but we certainly hope to expand this in the future. So I encourage you to visit them um, during the networking breaks and lunch times. We have over 40 amazing exhibitors in the exhibit hall right next door to us. Please be sure to visit them. In fact, that is where you are going to find your net break, uh, network break snacks and coffee and beverages. The attendee networking lounge is outside this door and to the right in the Shady Canyon room that is sponsored by PTC Therapeutics and is available for attendees to relax, connect, uses a meeting spot, so if you're setting up meetings on your app, please include that. A couple of things you all should have gotten your summit bags. There are some great items included. One of those is a portable USB drive. Please make sure you find it in there. It's small, and we realize it's kind of floating around. It is preloaded with all of our uh, fantastic toolkits, but there is still lots of storage space on it for you. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, particular, while we have a number of our topics here in print, we realize that many of you are traveling and may not want to carry home some toolkits, so you have them electronically. And last but not least, I want to extend a big thank you to all of our generous sponsors, providing more than two days of educational sessions, special events, and delicious meals at low to no cost for our patients and advocates is not possible without each and every one of them. I want to give special recognition to our presenting sponsors, PRA Health Sciences and Shire, our title sponsors, Eversana and Horizon. Pharma, and our platinum sponsors, excuse me, <clears throat> Genentech, Gilead, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, Pfizer, Retrofin, Sanofi, Genzyme. Please check them all out on your mobile app and the other 45 sponsors and supporters. Many of them are also in the exhibit hall. So we will be going now to our networking break. It is provided by Alliance Rx Walgreens Prime and is found next door in the exhibit hall. Track sessions will begin at 1130. Track one is located outside of the ballroom into your right. Track two is in the pavilion. It is the only track not right here in this main area. You are gonna go out by the pool. There will be people to help guide you around to the pavilion. It also means if you go that one, when you come out, you're gonna be right near an near the lunch. Track three will be in the theater across from the ballroom and track four we're going to be back in here. After those sessions start at 1130 they will wrap up at 1230 and we will have lunch out on the lawn. If you're looking in your um, printed directory there is an error in there and it says it's in the foyer here. It is not. It's out on the lawn. It'll be much more comfortable for us all out there. Uh, and check your mobile app throughout the day. We'll be pushing out notifications, and if any changes come up, that's where you're going to get the latest and greatest information. So um, please have a wonderful day, and we will see you back in here for a main session at 5.15. Thank you.